You're watching City Channel 4, your window to our community. I'm the executive director of NAMI Johnson County and I welcome all of you um, to our program tonight. I will, uh, we're pleased to have Ruth Keenly with us tonight and I'll let her take it from here. <laughs> Hello, so my name is Ruth Keenly. I am, oh that was right in my eye, sorry. I am a nurse at the University of Iowa and I'm also a lecturer for the College of Nursing as well as uh, someone who lives with mental illness. So I um, was had a class of students uh, this last semester at the university who were very sharp kids, really nice, and we had a patient who was a trans woman on the unit dealing with depression, suicidal ideation. And um, after we had our day, we, we went off to kind of have our debriefing that we do, and I mentioned something about charting the proper pronouns for this person. And the students looked at me like I'd grown like a second and third head at the same time and had no idea what I was talking about. And so I spoke with people at the university and we realized that there's really not a lot of education for nursing students about that. So we're working to change that. Um, they're now getting uh, a course, or at least a lecture in one of their primary courses. And then I designed one specially set up for mental health. So for me, this is kind of a little pet project that I have. So thank you for giving me a soapbox to vent for today. <laughs> I appreciate it greatly. And if you have any questions, please let me know. We'll also have time for questions at the end. But so we're going to be talking today about mental health concerns of the LGBTQA plus population. So, so we're going to go over terms because um, I don't want to assume that people know or don't know things. So if, if you are well knowledgeable on the subject, I apologize to be a lot of, uh, there'll be a lot of repetition. We're also going to talk about behavioral health disparities that are, uh, <coughs> affect this population as well as specific challenges and something that we can do about it as people in the community and then people, it, it's kind of, it's supposed to, just a basic education, so if you know somebody, you can kind of help make their lives a little easier. Nobody is paying me money to do this. Um, <laughs> there are um, no healthcare products. I also like to talk about, like, I am coming about this from a position of privilege. I am a white person who lives um, in a middle class, came from a middle class family and, and was able to get my education at the University of Iowa. I also am identified as female by others when they look at me. I'm an American and I'm part of the community. So I, I come from this with a lot of good things going for me that have made my life a lot easier than other people's. So I just like to point that out for go. So um, we're going to be talking about a lot of different things today. My name is Ruth Keenly. Um, I, the sex I was assigned at birth is female. The pronouns I prefer are they, them, theirs, or she, her, hers. I identify as a gender fluid person. And my uh, sexual identity is pansexuality, which means my sexual desire is towards people of all genders. And my sexual behavior is polyamorous. And if you don't know those, these words, that's okay. We're going to go over them. But what I'm trying to explain is that, like, if most people look at me, they will assume a few things about my sexuality and my gender identity based on the way I look. They will assume that I am a woman. And they will probably assume that I'm a gay woman. And that, but that is not accurate. And a lot of times the assumptions we have about people when we look at them can, is what tends to cause problems and stress for people. So we'll be going over these terms. So, you know, there. So we're going to do just some of the basics. Um, sex is your biological sex. That is talking about the genes in your body and then the organs that come with them. Usually there is um, a term used for people who have genetic disorders and that is called intersex, and those are people who are born with different um, types of, of sex characteristics. That is a whole separate thing from gender identity. Now, gender identity t is a social construct, and it tends to be binary, so what we know is man and woman, but that's not always the case. And I'm not just talking, and a, a lot of times people, you'll hear comments like, oh, nowadays people are just, you know, it's a fad. And that's not accurate. If you actually look historically, there are many cultures that have people that don't fit on the gender binary. One um, that is commonly known as two spirits um, in some Native American cultures were shamans and considered to have the, the embodiment of men and women at the same time. You also um, will see in Indian culture, there was a person who was born identified as male, lived as a woman, and was considered good luck to have at weddings and births. 
So there's a lot of different cultures that have multiple gender identities through history and through all over the world. So our gender expressions are the way we dress, the way we talk, the way we act. And that varies from culture to culture. For example, if um, uh, one of prominent is in India, it is much more common to see men physically affectionate with each other, regardless of, gen of, of sexual identity. In America, men being physically affectionate is taken in a completely different way. It's just not as common. And so that's the kind of thing you'll see with gender nor Gender norms are what we expect to see when s we identify someone as a certain gender. For example, if, uh, if someone you identify as a man has long hair, that's not considered always common. But that doesn't mean that that person's not male. It just means that they're expressing their gender in a different way. Um, and then we've got gender identity. And that's how the person sees themselves. That's how the person identifies who they are. Now, there's terms that you'll hear um, commonly called cisgender and transgender. Cisgender is kind of a catch-all term for people who identify by the gender that they were assigned at birth. And transgender means somebody who does not identify by the gender they assigned at birth. And that's a big umbrella. There's also, because it's never simple, a big spectrum of people who don't identify by really any gender. They p identify by a gender that is fluid and is not and just kind of varies they identify by no gender and that doesn't mean it's weird it just means that that's not the majority and but we're not used to seeing that because until recently it wasn't socially acceptable to outwardly identify yourself that it was dangerous and it still is dangerous for a lot of people so one of the reasons that you're hearing more about it is it's becoming safe safer for people to come out so one of the biggest things that you can do as a person to be kind to another person is to use the pronouns that they that are correct for them. Uh, the term sometimes you'll hear is preferred pronouns. I don't like to use that because that just means that, they, that, that it's a preference and not part of who they are. So um, a lot of times people are like, but what if I don't know the pronouns? What if like they look like a guy and I just call him he? And then, you know, there's and this is for the anybody who is a stickler with the English language. Webster Dictionary just said that you can call it an individual they. So it's covered. You're good. You can just call people they unless you know. It's very simple. It's very easy. And it's, it's nice. One of the things that we'll talk about is kind of institutionalized homophobia. And that's part of it is that our assumptions with, with pronouns, and it seems small, but when it's something that you're aware of, it, it, it's painful. It's incredibly painful to experience. So now that we've done that, we've just breezed over something that people spend their lives studying, we're on to sexuality, which is a completely different topic from gender and sex. Sexuality and gender do not... Oh, no, I like it. Sorry about that. No, you're fine. So sexuality, um, there's a lot of... Diff for a while, the 10% the number was floating around. They don't believe that's correct. Percentage-wise right now, 3.5 of adults in the United States identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. Now, there is a, an important distinction with identity because identity has become more than just who you are interested in. It has also become kind of a social and political thing as well. So identity can, can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. There's also behavior. For an example would be if you have a heterosexual priest that is celibate because of his religion, that does not negate the fact that he's heterosexual, but he doesn't engage in sex with other people. Does that make sense? So what you'll see is that kind of identity and orientation versus a behavior is important to separate. Because many times we'll have people who identify as heterosexual but may have sexual encounters with other people, and we need to remember that that it's it's different and as health uh, from my perspective as a healthcare professional it's important for me not to assume so um, and then there's a lot of terms and I wish I could give you like a pamphlet with a book that said all of them and then it was done but that's not how it works unfortunately terms change and evolve much faster than I could print out pamphlets um, I can let you know that there are some terms that are okay and there's some terms that are not acceptable. Um, some terms that used to be medically acceptable that are not okay. A term that used to be used frequently is hermaphrodite mm -hmm. as a medically acceptable term for intersex. That is not okay anymore. We, we pr prefer people use the term intersex. Um, uh, for trans individuals, it is usually trans man or trans woman or man or woman depending on the person's preference. Terms such as tranny and she-male are not okay, please don't use them. <laughs> um, there's also words that are that people find frustrating because 
they're okay. So for some situations, they're okay, and some they're not. One I can say is is that oftentimes, instead of giving people that slide I showed you at the beginning, I just tell people that I'm queer because it's one word and it's easy, and then I don't have to have like a chat. But um, on other times, if somebody on the street who doesn't know me pointed at me and yelled queer at me, I would be offended. It depends on the context and the individual. Um, what I always tell people is, if you don't know and you know the person well, ask. If you don't know and don't want to know the person well, you don't have to know. That's one of the things, and I'm, I'm a curious person. I like to know things. It's, I, I can't stop until I find, but it's not my business, really, sometimes, what somebody's sexuality is. And so if I don't know a term that they're comfortable with, I just don't have to say it. That tends to be my thing. Um, the LGBTQA is a mouthful if you're not used to saying it. The L stands for lesbian, G stands for gay, B stands for bi, T stands for trans. Q is also queer, also questioning. One of the important things that's becoming more and more okay is that people, to be not sure about their sexuality. It's, it's not a little box that everybody fits into two of them and that's how it works. Everybody is individual on how they experience interactions with others and, we, and we're becoming more okay with people not sure. A is identified for asexuality. Those are people who do not have sexual attraction to others. That does not mean that it's a medical condition or there's something wrong. That just means that some people don't have that interest in other people. And then the plus is for the giant diverse bubble out there of, of people. Who not everybody fits in or is comfortable with the term. So Now that we've covered <laughs> everything on that, um, very brief, I wanted to talk about the stuff that I am interested in mostly, which is challenges in healthcare with this population, especially related to mental health, which is what we're here talking about. So one of the problems is, is that the research is very minimal. It's convenient samples used by people who are comfortable and open with identifying, and they're small samples because it's such a small percentage of the population. And because it's such a small part of the population, a lot of healthcare providers don't have experience with this population. And unfortunately, some people use that to expect their patients to educate them on their own identity, which is not okay. That is not a person's job when they're ill to educate their healthcare provider on their own life. So a lot of times research doesn't catch up because people and social changes happen so much faster than research will. So that's a lot of the problems that we have and one of the main reasons we have so much trouble getting care to LGBT populations. So it's really important to remember, um, while research does show high rates of depression, anxiety, suicide attempts, suicide ideation, and substance abuse, that is not the whole population. It's one of those things where we're looking at a small sect of a small sect of the population. Most LGBT people um, are develop resiliency as a result of stigma that they have to deal with and don't develop mental illness. What we're looking at is a small sample of this population. For example, it's, uh, it, the example I've used before is People with schizophrenia, by and large, obviously are not aggressive people, but in the hospital, what I see is a small population of people who, as a result of their illness, one of their symptoms is aggression. That doesn't mean that everybody with that is aggressive, it just means that we're seeing a small part of a small population. So I just wanted to point that out. So what are the reasons that people who are identified in this population have these higher rates? Mostly, it, it's looking like environmental is what the research shows us. A lot of times people face rejection as a result of this or social isolation. If you're such a small part of the population, you may not know or meet other people who identify this way. Iowa City actually has um, one of the highest per capita populations of, of lesbian identified women in the country. That's, we have one of the highest populations of LGB identified people, which is fantastic, but also means that we need to know more because there's so many people who identify that way in our community. Um, there's also, as I mentioned before, institutionalized homophobia. And institutionalized homophobia is big things, like in the majority of the states in the United States, you can be rejected for a home loan because you're gay, still. In many states, you can be fired, still. Gay marriage is legal, but that does not mean that all the discrimination went out the door. It'd be nice if it did, but we haven't done that yet. So those, those are the big things. So you also see small things. For example, if you have a patient who is a man and he's wearing a wedding ring and you ask him what his wife does, that is an assumption that he's married to a woman. And while it seems small, those kind of little comments build up in a person's mind to make them feel like they're not normal. 
And that obviously causes stress and can lead to mental health issues. And I'd also like to point out that for some of this, it can lead to very positive coping. For example, I realized my students weren't educated, so I made a thing and I educated them. That's positive coping. And, <coughs> and, but, and some people develop negative po coping and end up disliking themselves or having a lot of, or using substances to cope with the stress. There's a lot of different ways people cope. But positive coping is also very common. I just want to point that out. Okay. So if we're going to talk about a few specific considerations for this population that other populations don't have. Coming out, families of choice, dual stigma, and bi erasure. So coming out, I think we've all seen the after TV specials where there's like a, a teenage child who's just like emotionally turmoil and then they burst out at the dinner and then somebody laughs about something and then everything's hunky-dory. And that's what we, most people tend to think of when they mean coming out. I mean, somebody say, hey, I'm gay, and then they're done. But that's not really what happens. It's not a linear process, and it's a lifelong process. Every time somebody who is, in, who is LGBT identified is in a new situation, they have to decide what they want to disclose. And I think it's unfortunate, too, that a lot of pressure is for people to come out, because coming out isn't necessary if it isn't important to you. There's a lot of, I think that there's, we often tell people that they have to. Like it's, it's a part of your life, like that, you know, you got to go to prom in high school, you got to come out, you got to go, like there's, it's one of the steps. <laughs> and that's not how it works. And, and, it, and even if you do choose to come out, people don't come out with all the things at once. Uh, an example is um, at work, I am very open about being uh, a pansexual person, which is uh, similar to bisexuality but I am not open about being gender fluid because that would cause problems and just be stressful for myself and my coworkers. And so I choose not to and I don't think I feel like I need to because it's, but that is my personal choice. Somebody else who identifies similarly to I do may feel like it is really important for them to be out in those aspects. Often people are out to friends, um, not to family. What I'm trying to say is that it's never like a simple like, you come out once and then you're done. Unless you're Ellen DeGeneres and you got to do it in a magazine. I guess that's like the one situation. <laughs> she's, she's done, she did it. But not the, re the rest of us do not have magazines. I have no magazines. So it becomes a, a, a almost common thing that you have to do. And so it's really important, and I'm, the part in there is about patient is, is from my perspective. It's really important, for example, if you have a friend or a family member who is, who is wanting to come out, to not discourage them, but have them consider safety. Because cons like, I am very privileged in the fact that when I came out, um, I think the, the harshest comment I got was, I don't like big news over the phone, but that's fine. <laughs> like, you know, like that's kind of what you'll see. But other friends, uh, other people I know, have been kicked out of their homes. They've been sent to um, degaying camps. They, um, a person I was very close to, I remember her mother told her that she should have been an abortion when she came out. And so that, is, and people deal with physical violence. It, it's such a huge range of concerns. So it's really important to have people think about it before they come out. And just really think about like, like are you physically safe, emotionally? Like what will you do if they're not okay with you? Like those are really good, important things. And to be supportive, but realistic. For example, if I lived, in, if I was a, like a young child that lives in a very conservative home where the family is very not okay with that and they're financially dependent on that family, maybe it might not be the time for them to come out. And so as somebody who would be a friend of this person, it's important for you to support them and kind of help them through this process because it's really emotionally. I remember when I came out, that was like a, like a week build up to like getting the phone call and it was like big, like it's, ex it's really stressful and I, mine went lovely. And for a lot of people, they don't have that luck. So, um, and like I said, negative reactions, if they don't anticipate, I've, I've had many, many patients come in or friends who have felt, have suicidal thoughts or substance abuse as a result of, of those negative reactions because you have to cope in some way. And if rejection from a family it is devastating for many people. And so having to deal with that is, is exhausting and most people end up making choices that are unhealthy, unfortunately. So as a friend or a family member of these people, it's good to, to be knowledgeable and be supportive. Families of choice. I don't think this particularly just applies to the LGB t population, but it's becoming more prevalent as that population's getting a voice in that um, a lot of times families 
biological families aren't your family necessarily. Um, a lot of times, especially with the LGBT population, you end up getting rejected by family, so you build your own family. And I think we can all, I mean, I'm sure we all have people in our lives that are family, but they're not biological family. We all have those, those close reactions. A problem is, is that if somebody, for example, comes into the hospital in a mental health crisis and their family is their, is their DPOA or emergency contact and their family's not supportive of their transition, and insists on calling this person by the wrong name and the wrong gender, that will not help their suicidal ideation. That's going to be harmful for them. So it's really important to educate yourself and your friends and your family on like getting emergency contacts in place and getting a designated power of attorney, especially if that person's relationship with their biological family is not okay. Because if somebody's already in crisis, you don't want to add something to the pile that can be fixed before that becomes an issue. All right. And a lot of times, uh, and, it, and it's little things, for example, when I have people come and visit the hospital and I would see someone who, in my mind, looked like the dad, I would say, oh, are you the patient's father? And then I'd let them in. I try now to not assume relationships because you don't know. And I don't as, uh, are you, I usually ask, are you a relative? Are you a family? And those kind of things. Because then it gives people a, a chance to explain. So it's really important. It's using inclusive language is a small thing for us to do. And it takes practice, but it's really meaningful for the people who you are talking to. OK. So dual stigma is something that is basically dealing with being in two minorities. It's stressful enough to be a person who lives with mental illness, but adding on to that being in a, another minority is, is very anxiety producing and very stressful. So there's the stigma and rejection within the minorities. I definitely can, exp like any group of people is a microcosm of the population as a whole. So there are people within the LGBT community who are very prejudiced against people with mental illness. And that's because there are people out in the wider community that feel the same way. So unfortunately, when you're with, like it's, it's it's hard to create safe spaces when there's prejudice already within them. So one of the things that we should be aware of is our own issues and our own um, biases against people. I remember when I was in school, it drove, I hated it, when the teacher would always get and be like, think about your own thoughts. And I thought that was the dumbest thing that anybody had ever told me. And then I became a psych nurse and I was like, oh, this is what they're doing. <laughs> That's why this is, because it really does help you be aware of what your prejudices are and what is causing you to think about a certain population a certain way. So, all right. So you guys have been nice enough to let me, this is my soapbox. I'm gonna rant about this for a while. I promise it'll be quick and won't be too rambly. So bi erasure is a term used to talk about how people um, who are bisexual and the fact that they are bisexual is removed historically, culturally, socially, and politically. Um, a couple examples that I like to use is, uh, did anybody else know that James Dean was bi? Eh? Yeah! Go team. <laughs> but really, like, that's not, that's, was that ever brought up? Um, Angelina Jolie is a, identifies as a bisexual woman. And the only reason I don't go really far back in history, because there are many examples, is that there's those people like, existed in a time before bisexuality ex like, was named. For example, Julius Caesar was a person who enjoyed sex with men and women, so nowadays would be labeled as bisexual in some aspects. So what I'm saying is, is that no, but I did not know any of these things until I started looking. And that's the thing is socially remove bisexuality from, uh, from our <coughs> understanding. And that's because it makes people uncomfortable. I have lost count of the times that I have been told to pick a side if anybody wants to take me seriously. And that's and it, because people view it as a choice. And so it's really important for us to realize that um, bisexuality is very much a part of the community and very important. Does anybody know like what amount of the community, like if like 100 percent, zero to 100, it identifies as bisexual? Any any ideas? 50 percent. 50 percent of the LGB community are people that identify as bisexual, and a lot of times people don't forget that, and uh, people will forget that and don't understand that we're not uh, like we're we're cutting out half of that population and not providing services and understanding people so I mean things that people say when I talk, spoke about microaggressions before those little comments like well like like for example if I started dating a woman I have definitely gotten the comments like so are you gay now 
like, and I, I and from well-meaning people, these aren't like monsters that I'm friends with. These are like good people who just don't know what to say. And so it, it becomes very exhausting for people who identify as bisexual because they don't feel accepted in any community. If they date, um, if, it's, if I dated a man, I would feel weird in a heterosexual setting at times. And, but if I dated a woman, I, it, it just it becomes complicated and people don't get accepted into the places where they used to be comfortable. I remember I dated a woman for quite a while and then I started dating a guy and all of a sudden the, the, the lesbian community got a little spiky. Not everyone, but like you do get like a sense of like kind of like you're not real. Like you're, you are not allowed in this space because you are, you are not a real gay. And there are higher rates of depression, anxiety, suicide, and eating disorders in the bisexual community than in the gay and lesbian community. And I think that is again a result of, of the rejection that people can face. So important to know. So one of the myths of bisexuals is that it is a phase. Um, yeah, I think that everybody, there, there were like jokes when I was going through college, like, oh, you'll get it out of your system, and then you'll be a grown up, and then you'll marry a farm boy and make babies. And um, there's also the common misconception that people are promiscuous or unfaithful, and that they have high rates of STDs, including HIV. And research shows that all of these are inaccurate. Um, and it's important to acknowledge your own feelings. If you have, if, if the idea of somebody, like I, I've definitely had people before like, I don't have any prejudice against bisexual people. And they'd be like, okay, would you date someone who's bi who's, who slept with someone of a different gender? Well, I don't, I don't know about that. Like that's, that seems a little much. And that's a very common response. So being aware of your own feelings and being accepting of anybody that you know that is brave enough to come out to you is really important. All right. So one of the things, this is, uh, a little bit of the, the nurse, more nurse side of me, but I wanted to bring up a lot of times that you'll see people with different diagnosis that may not actually fit their diagnosis, like what they are because of their circumstances. Uh, one thing, a case that I think of that comes to mind would be a young man who came from a very conservative family, um, identified as gay, and then once he came out, started um, having a lot of sex and um, became pretty active in the drug community. And so this person, then started dating someone kind of that stabilized. They ended up stopping to using drugs and they weren't promiscuous. And that person was diagnosed with bipolar. And that really wasn't an accurate diagnosis. What was accurate is that this person was adjusting to a complete change of lifestyle and probably would have what we would say would be adjustment disorder. And so that is really common to see those kind of, if, you, if somebody isn't looking at a situation properly, people will get a diagnosis that doesn't fit them just because the healthcare providers aren't looking at the situation through the right lens. Another common thing will happen is substance abuse. Um, LGBT people have a higher rate of substance abuse, commonly related to the rejection and, and trying to cope with. Because um, if they don't have anything else, that's a substance that, that works in some ways, but not very well. And so that is some things that you'll also see. So just wanted to bring those up. All right. I posted this on Facebook a while back when I was in a, in a particularly ranty day. And I had one of the most interesting discussions I've ever seen and I loved it because what it talked about is how people have had to pathologize their gender identity to get any sort of medical treatment. Um, and for many people who identify as transgender, being in their body is an incredibly uncomfortable experience. Not everybody, and it, the term is dysphoria, and it can usually lead to its pain, discomfort, um, self-harm thoughts are very common. Not everybody who's trans has dysphoria, but to be treated with anything that would help with that, like a surgery or hormones, they have to pathologize their illness, they, or I'm sorry, pathologize their gender. They have to basically say, my identity is an illness, so I can get treatment. And unfortunately, we have to classify it as a mental illness because if it's classified as, a, as like a, a hormonal thing, it's, n it's considered cosmetic and is not covered by insurance. So we're moving towards better. Um, the DSM-5, the DSM-4 used to identify being trans as a mental illness. Now they identify the dysphoria as, a, as an issue. But that also means that somebody who is trans but doesn't have dysphoria but still needs hormone treatment has to lie and say that they have dysphoria to get the care that they need. So 
it, it was just a fascinating discussion of like long Facebook rants. But it's really interesting because like it's a fine line because people need care. And the only way we take their care seriously is if they have their identity pathologized and turned into an illness. So there's a really fantastic hashtag on Twitter, which makes me feel weird saying that, but um, it's called trans health fail. And it was people talking about things that they'd had to experience in real life. Like this isn't just like me coming up with case studies in my head. This is people who like talked about their issues. One person t um, on here said that they, um, they had to take a pregnancy test before they got an x-ray, even though they don't have a uterus. <laughs> which is wasteful, first yeah. of all. <laughs> but incredibly painful for the person. I have a, a, a good friend of mine is trans, and he had appendicitis. We were supposed to go to Magic Mike, but instead we went to the ER. And um, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, and he ended up with like getting some very unnecessary procedures done because they didn't believe that it was appendicitis. They thought it had to be something with his urinary tract system. And so he ended up having to get some very uncomfortable things done because they were insistent on it being something that wasn't real. And so that's the, and that's not like a out of the, that's not a surprise. That's not a one time and like that is a very <laughs> common issue for people in trans healthcare. And so my students were asking this and I remember we, we had the patient that I mentioned before that was in for suicidal ideation. Somebody, and it's a student thing. They weren't trying to be heard. They just really, they're like, what about his penis? Or, but what about her penis? Like, what, what do we do about it? I was like, okay, so you had eight other patients today. Do you know anything about their genitalia? And the students went, well, no. And I was like, then you don't need to know about that one. And, that, and I understand <laughs> that we all have, like, as a culture, we have a morbid fascination with surgeries and, and things like that. And people are curious. And I get that. People are allowed to be curious, but there is an internet out there full of wonderful things that are beyond cat videos that can educate <laughs> you on all you need to know. But a person who's, con who's talking to you is not the person who needs to do that. It's not someone's job to teach you about surgeries, and it's not your job to assume that somebody needs surgeries. I remember um, there's more of these, and there's one that hit me that it was um, somebody, the nurse called the person into appointment and the person stood up and they said, that can't be you, the chart says male. Like, <laughs> ah, and it's really, and, or another comment is, I don't specialize in transgenders, but I hear you can learn about that online. And that's the thing is that people are sometimes afraid because they don't know anything about something to, to be there for a person. But just because if you're not incredibly knowledgeable at, about a topic, doesn't mean that you can't be supportive of the person you love. The fact that a person you love is, is a trans or, or identifies as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, or any kind of identity, doesn't negate the person that you know. And I think a lot of times we, we want to identify people so much by that one thing because it's such a politicized discussion that we forget that they're the person. Like it's like, I know that I am also, I'm gay, but I'm also Ruth. I really like uh, my cat. I talk about it too much. Like I, like, shush. <laughs> Sorry. Like there's a lot of different things about us or a person that are more than just that identity. And sometimes it becomes such a focus that we forget that even if we aren't as educated as we can, but you can still support the person that you care about. And it's not that hard to educate yourself because most of us are lucky enough to have internet access in some form and can learn things. Um, all right. So considerations for transgender population. I want to take like my marker and like cross out preferred because I put that in wrong. Using the correct pronouns. I know it seems like a small thing. When people tell me it's too hard, this is the uh, comment I usually say. If you, any, I'm assuming most people like dogs. So if your friend, you go to your friend's house and they have a dog, and you say, oh, he's so cute. And they're like, oh, it's a she. You immediately start calling the dog a she. If you can do it for a dog, you can do it for a person. It's sometimes hard. You might make mistakes, but you can still do it. Like, it's so easy. Like, you just be like, oh, I mean she. Like, people can do that so easily and quickly for animals. I think we can do it for fellow humans. I believe in us. We can do this. Um, legal changes are often very costly and difficult. Um, it's actually cheaper to change your name on a marriage certificate than it is to change your name just legally. Like I have, I have friends that are trans that it would be much cheaper for them to just get married and change their name than it would be to 
change their name legally. So remember that just because someone's name is something on a legal document doesn't mean that that's what it is for them. Um, so there's also challenges to expanding access. You know, we're slowly getting better. We're slowly trying to make things more inclusive. Um, the University of Iowa has an LGBT clinic that is open on Thursdays <laughs> in the evening, but um, they also ha are working really hard to make things more open and, and more accepting. They're currently, uh, the information that I'm presenting to you today is actually through the education branch of the Human Rights Campaign, which is the people with the blue field with a little yellow equal sign on there that you see it on the bumper stickers. That is the uh, HRC, and they are actually, the University of Iowa is trying to become certified as an LGBT healthcare center. And so that's where I got the information that I'm presenting today from, is from that organization. And so there, there are steps happening. Slower than anybody wants, but that's kind of how it tends to go. But one of the things that is most important, I think, when working with someone or having a friend who is trans or knowing someone is thinking, is this question necessary? Like, I don't feel like it's necessary for me to know the nitty gritty of my friend's private business. And I think most people think of that for most of their friends. And that's okay. To, to give people that private space. If they want to share, that's different. If your friend wants to tell you a story, let them tell you a story. But you shouldn't assume that it's your right to know just because they're okay with telling you that they're trans. Um, yes, I always think, is this necessary for me to ask? So what can we do? We can advocate. Nami is amazing at that. I love you guys, they're so fun. But um, Nam, that, is, that is what you can do. You can be advocates for people. Um, and you can also check your own behavior. I was talking to someone the other day and they talked about how one of their friends is a trans woman and they were cringing because they realized that they had complimented their, that person on their makeup ability as if it was surprising that they were good at makeup. Real, not thinking, but realizing that that is an internal prejudice that they had. And we all have them. I am a shining example of making mistakes. I'm great at it, I practice all the time. But it, it's important to, to try and to, and to educate yourself the best you can. All right, so self-assessments are important, I think. I'm not gonna read these all to you, because I think you can do that. But um, it's really important to just think about what your own assumptions are. A lot of times people will say, I don't have any preju prejudice, and they'll be like, well, do you think that lesbians hate men? And they'll be like, yeah. <laughs> yes, they do, and that's <laughs> and and you hear that so often. So it's important to not just only think like, am I prejudiced? But like, is this specific thing something I believe? And realizing that. So one of the ones that hit me a little bit was, do I feel sorry for people who identify as LGBT? Because in some ways, I think there is like a pity aspect a lot of times in interactions, like because of the stigma people deal with. But that that for me was like, oh. Because I realize my own prejudice, so sometimes I do. Sometimes I feel like if I have a patient who has a, like bipolar disorder and is also identifying as trans and all the hormones, I'm like, God, like that's, like I feel sorry for them and that's not okay. <laughs> like that's not how I should feel for that person. But realizing your own prejudices can be really helpful. All right, the treatment's the same for treating mental illness, which is delightful. Um, but while considering um, resources and availability, one of the things I always like to bring up is, um, Conversion therapy, if you haven't heard of it, it is the um, way that you send somebody who's gay off to a counselor or a camp and they come back not gay. And that is illegal in several states and uh, has been condemned by over 20 large professional organizations, including the American Medical Association and the American Psychiatric Association. Conversion therapy is ineffective. It does not fix people from being gay and it can cause a lot of emotional and uh, harm and lead to a lot of complications for a person, so. All right, so this is resources that are available. Obviously there's national and then there's local. Um, Planned Parenthood and Emma Goldman have a long history of being very supportive of people in the LGBT community. And then the LGBT clinic at the <coughs> University of Iowa is also available. But those are some of the places that are out and then um, all those resources up there are available if you would like more information. So basic things to remember is everybody deserves basic dignity regardless of their identity and I think I, I, I like I like the optimist to me likes to think that most people are decent and try to not be mean to other people and so I think that we all try our best and it's just educating yourself can be helpful to the person and being informed of your own bias can be also be helpful so that is all I have ta-da 
I love questions. Yes, please ask questions. I like them. Another good resource uh, for people is PFLAG, uh, yeah, which stands for parents and friends of lesbians and gays, but also transgenders. <laughs> That's online. They may even have a local group in Cedar Rapids, and I think um, I've been talking to UAY about maybe starting one for the parents there. That's a great idea. Yeah. So um, PFLAG is an organization, it's a fantastic organization that is, um, was created by parents of people who identify as, as a way to support their children and is available for families and, and people who are in the community and an awesome resource if you're looking for one. Uh, alongside that, the Iowa City VA also is providing LGBTQ plus services and they've been recognized pretty recently for that. And the VA is really getting on top of it, which is pretty cool. I mean, nationwide. Thank you. No, I did not know that. I appreciate that. It's great. Do a little dance during the silence. <laughs> All right, and I have another comment too, that um, in the ethics for um, certified rehab counselors, it is considered unethical to uh, uh, um, the counsel, the Kirk conversion therapy is unethical and is unethical not to treat um, gay, lesbian, and bisexual. Yeah, no, it's getting so much better than it used to be. And it's great to hear that, like, a lot of individual organizations are coming out and making it very clear where they stand on it. Um, when you listed the rate of suicide amongst the LBGTQA plus community, yes. in comparison, say, from the 80s to now, has it increased or decreased? That is a great question, <laughs> and I honestly, I don't have specific numbers at the top of my head. Um, I don't know, and one of the problems and one of the reasons that we don't know is there wasn't a lot of research done at that time, and only in the research now is, is very small and convenient samples. So I'm sorry I don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> I wish I did. Um, but um, we do think that it does show that the, um, it is trending down um, as, as treatment is becoming available, as, as it's becoming less of an issue of isolation and rejection from family with coming out, it does seem to be trending in a lower end. It's also one of the things that I think that we're becoming more and more aware of is, that, uh, is the substance abuse issue. Mm -hmm. Because socially for a lot of LGBT people, it's hard to find a social event that isn't centered around a bar. Or, um, or alcohol or substance abuse of some kind, which in some sense makes sense if you don't have any support and you don't have health care and you can't cope. Drugs are a, an, easy or an easier thing to access and, and do provide some short-term relief. But unfortunately, uh, that, and it's hard too because that's, that it's such a part of, it's become such a part of the cu culture that I don't know if the rate of substance abuse has gone down, but I, the rate of uh, suicide attempts are trending down is nice. Thank you. Sorry, I can't answer your question better. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh. Thanks. In your teaching, you talk about twin studies? Um, not often, because there, there's not a lot of twin studies done, but is there a specific, there's some, but I mean for yeah, LGBT. With, with an extremely high percentage of identical twins, both have, you know, grow up to be gay. Yeah. And that's, that tells you it's not a fad and you know, and so on. Related question, you talk about the historical part, that as long as in recorded, as long as history has been recorded in human species, there have been examples of the, of the community in every group. And that is hardly a, a fad or anything that can happen. Agreed. Now that is something that you will, a frustration of mine is that you'll commonly hear people be like, like, um, uh, I was told that the fact that I identify, don't identify by a specific gender is because I want to be part of the fad. Mm -hmm. And I didn't kick that person, which I think shows good personal growth <laughs> on my part. I think it shows that I've, I'm, I'm an adult, in, uh, yes, in many ways wise. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I like how that one got the 
biggest laugh. I know, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but but it is it is an unfortunate trend that it is as you s as I've said, like it it's getting better, but it, it's a slow change, and and people like I think one of the ones that makes me think of uh, the uh, Wachowski siblings. Um, does any, ev I'm sure everybody's seen The Matrix at some point. Um, one of, I believe both of the sisters uh, have come out as trans recently, the second sister did. And so that was a big, like, as you said, with twin studies, and, and so there is a, there's definitely a genetic correlation and, and it's a huge component. And also it's, it's hard to also quantify because human sexuality isn't like a, it's not like somebody's gay or somebody's trans or somebody, you know, it, it's such a huge spectrum that it, it's like, okay, you're 30% you're gay, so your family's not gay, but if you're like 35, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to quantify that in any way. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I've been retired for a long time, but I was a K-12 mm -hmm. teacher. What's being taught school counselors these days? I know you're a nurse, but what's going on with, with that? You know, um, it depends on the school, obviously. Um, and it depends on, for public schools, for example, there is, um, you know, there, it, it depends, and again, on the state, it varies. Um, in some states, it's still obviously legal to fire teachers for coming out as, as gay. And so that, you know, it depends. In Iowa, it's not, which is lovely which is why I can be here and not worry. Um, but uh, s counselors are becoming more educated and they're, they're starting to have more specific, excuse me, courses for counselors to learn about that. They're also putting education into, into their studying. I know that, um, I mean, I, I am obviously not a counselor, but um, people I know who have or people who I know who are, are currently are talk about how they, many of their courses included working with minorities, including LGBT youth. So I think it's getting, like I said, it's getting better. <laughs> it's just a slow, slow process. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, for basic information, can you clarify what is the difference between pansexual and gender fluid? Yes, sure. So uh, pansexual and is, is a sexual identity, and gender fluidity is a uh, sexual, uh, like, a, like a, is a gender. So uh, pansexuality is a newer term that has become more popular because um, it, it is a more inclusive term, I guess. Um, it does not mean that I like to date pans, as I've heard probably 50 times, that joke. Um, but it, what it means is that um, people who identify as pansexual are attracted to people of all genders. And so what it's trying to do is take out that kind of dichotomy of gender binary and open it up a little bit. And it's also kind of, it's become more popular among kind of a, I don't want to say a younger crowd, because I don't, but it, it, it's become more popular in the current generation of like millennials. It's a, it's a term that they like to use, and I like to use personally because it, it's more comfortable for me. Gender queer, gender fluid is a gender identity that falls outside of the uh, male female, and it means people who don't just, uh, we kind of f move around. Like, I don't know a better, it just, I, the only thing I can tell you is that when somebody calls me a woman, it makes me uncomfortable, and somebody calls me a man, it makes me uncomfortable. And so, it, and, and some days it doesn't, it just, it fluctuates, which is, I'm not expecting strangers to, to know that and know my innate feelings and have to, but that's why it's more comfortable for me to not use specific pronouns because it, it doesn't, it's, every person is different, um, and, but for me, the, the feeling I get is, is kind of, you know that like the feeling when like you hear nails on a chalkboard that kind of in the back of your teeth? That's the feeling I get when I get gendered. And that's just, and that's not, and not, not that people are being mean or anything wrong, but that's just, kind of, for me, again, I'm not speaking for every gender fluid person on the face of the planet, but it, it, that is, tends to be what people who are gender fluid identify as that kind of fluctuating and not really fitting in one category. Yeah, good question, thank you. And then, so, sorry, something I didn't bring up earlier is, in, is not always part of the LGBT community, but is a term that you may start hearing, uh, is polyamory. And, um, and it's a, there's, it, it kind of, there's, a, there's monogamy and there's non-monogamy. And people who um, identify or, or practice polyamory are, is not polygamy. I'd like to separate that away really quick, which is a, a religious thing, usually involving a man with multiple women. 
But um, polyamory is, a, is people who date multiple people at the same time. And not in a sneaky, I'm cheating on you way, but in a people who date multiple people that everybody knows about each other and everybody's okay with that. And that's something that's becoming more socially acceptable, obviously still not super, super catching on. But it is, it is something that, is <laughs> you know, not, well, you know, like it, it, in college or like in Iowa City, I can say that and people are like, oh, cool. But if I went home to my small town, they'd look at me like I'd sprouted a second head if I said I was polyamorous. But it, it's something that's becoming more common as people are realizing that they don't have to fit themselves into a little box that they're not comfortable in. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you for listening to me. I appreciate it. watching City Channel 4, your window to our community.